everybody. I'm Latasha, um, Mr. Most people know me by Redix um, from the years before of CCHF, so that's why the Redix is in there. Um, so our session today is the data matters, right? Our goal on today is to give you a little bit of some behaviors that we use at Church Health that help you to use data to drive your decisions and to create optimal results. So a little bit of my background, healthcare professional over 20 years, started out clinically as a medical assistant, worked in multiple settings, primary care specialty, as well as the hospital setting, and then found my love for healthcare being behind the scenes with reports and how can we make this thing work. Um, and right now my role, I tell everybody, if it doesn't make money, it doesn't make sense. My job is to keep the lights on and keep people's paychecks coming. And with that, I do use a lot of data, sound decision making, right? And then working closely with our teams to make sure that it works and it works well for everyone. So as the Director of Clinical Administration, I'm responsible for the front end to the back end of our operations. So patient service assistants that help with getting appointments booked, checked in, all the way down to the revenue services piece whereby the money is coming back to us. <clears throat> church Health, anybody know who Church Health is, where Church Health is in Memphis? Few people, cool. All right, so Church Health, faith-based, privately funded clinic um, that was founded to serve Memphis's uninsured and underinsured, and now we're doing it for Shelby County all across the state of Tennessee. Um, on average, we have about 12,000 unique patients seeing over 60,000 encounters per year. Inside of our practice, we're not just medical, we've grown. We've got medical, physical therapy, eye, dental, spiritual care, behavior health, nutrition, child life, exercise, whole nine yards, right? Our goal as an organization is to take care of the whole person. Um, <clears throat> and we want to do it in, in, in a faith setting. Um, we don't call ourselves a Christian organization. We see people in all walks of life and we wanna meet them where they are and be able to help them. So, faith-based, always go to the scripture. And that's my basis wholeheartedly for um, my presentation. For which of you desiring to build a tower does, the, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it, right? And I think scripture is telling us in this, just like what I'm gonna talk about, right, is the data matters. If you're gonna sit down and build a tower, you might wanna make sure you've got the resources to take care of it, right? Same with when we're looking at data. We don't just make knee-jerk knee decisions when it comes down to our finances or do it from our gut. If we do, we pay for it later, fair. Um, so first things first, we're gonna talk through feelings over facts, and then we'll dive deeper into the data. Everybody good with that? All right, I'm gonna ask for some interactions along the way. Oh, I've got some notepads and ink pens at the front if you want some. Feel free to grab them if you wanna do that for notes. Feelings over facts. Scenario number one is around patients checking in late. All right, real situation. Tasha, we always have patients checking in late. They're checking in past the 15 minute mark. Got me behind, got my clinic behind, got patients waiting longer, I'm staying later. Who's heard it? Who's been the one to say it? <laughs> Those of us that have heard it, how many of us have immediately gone to do something about it? I raise my hand, I have in the past. Doc comes and says, this is happening. I'm like rushing to the front desk. What is going on, y'all? Were they really late? What's happening? Is the bus late? What, what's happening, right? I've done it. I've learned better, right? Now I allow data to drive me instead of the feelings of someone. Um, that's my biggest goal, right? We always want to let the facts win because our feelings don't always treat us the right way. <laughs> and here we go. The feeling, patients are always checked in late. Ran a few reports. The data said that's not so true. 96.6% of the time, our patients are checked in within that 15 minute window that says they are on time. 
didn't discount that 3.4% that weren't checked in on time, right? Okay. <laughs> um, but it really wasn't a hair on fire situation. Let there be light. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? It wasn't a hair on fire situation that was presented to us as the provider gave it to us. Felt that way, probably because there were numerous patients that were seeming like they were checking in late on a particular day or on a particular week. And that's why we go back to the data to allow the data to help us to make some decisions. Now, what we did do was say, hey, thank you for sharing this. Share it to us every time it happens so that we can look at each instance independently and determine if there is opportunity for improvement for us. But overall, our patient services team is doing an amazing job of checking people in on time. Side note, does everybody recognize their registration staff, patient services team? Do y'all really see those as kind of the forefront of y'all's practice? If they aren't there, no matter what we do when we get to the exam room, it's useless. So, side note, I always tell people, honor your team, the whole team, not just the ones that work beside you. All right, scenario number two. This one is around difficulty wayfinding to our pay, um, physical rehab department. So, in Memphis, Crosstown Concourse uh, used to be a Sears distribution center. Been since renovated, it is huge, and you will get lost. I work there every day, I get lost constantly, right? Church health is inside of Crosstown. <clears throat> but physical rehab, it's a journey to find it. Seriously, I know my way there the back way, but if I was a patient coming in the door, it would be a problem. Wouldn't be able to do it. So our physical rehab team felt like our patients have got to be getting lost. They can't find their way, right? We need to do something. Well, Church Health, we'll talk about it a little bit, we have an internal quality improvement course. So physical rehab was coming through the course. They were feeling like patients were getting lost. Nobody told them patients were getting lost. It was just their assumption, right? Again, feeling, right? Did a little bit of digging. A little bit of voice of the customer. A little bit of looking at reports. What do y'all think we found? Who all thinks they were really getting lost? Who thinks people were rarely getting lost? They were rarely getting lost, y'all. And here we go. Um, the feeling was they were getting lost, can't find us. Well, 6% reported difficulty finding physical rehab. Imagine if we had gone with our feeling what we would have done. We bought signs. We probably put markers down on the floor walking people to PT, hired somebody to be an escort, right? We spent all kinds of money trying to make this work because our feeling was this is something that's constantly happening. And even better, by the time we did a little baseline data, we found that patients were actually arriving about five minutes early for their new patient appointments to PT. So they weren't getting lost. But because of how complex the space is, it really made people feel like this has got to be difficult. And I'll be honest and say I was one that was on board for saying this has got to be difficult because I couldn't find my way. The normal way. I, found, I knew my way the back door way, which is what we use as staff. But if I was a patient, I felt like I wouldn't be able to do it. Patients are pretty smart. They found their way with no problem. All right? So, Everybody good with why we're having this conversation? All right, so we're gonna flip. We're gonna have a little bit of discussion where we can flip this instead of feelings over fact, let's put our facts over our feelings, okay? Because managing and decision-making based on our facts can be a recipe for continuous change, no improvement. It's almost the definition of insanity. Same thing over and over again expecting a different result, right? Exactly. 
So what we want to do is utilize data to help drive our decisions. And even if the data doesn't make a decision for us, we want to utilize data to at least drive questions to try and better understand it, to know if there even is a decision that needs to be made, right? Because we learned in PT was that, did a little bit of digging. The data really didn't drive a decision. It told us to keep doing what we were doing. So no need for us to spend a lot of resources trying to accomplish that. All right, so why is database decision making important? Somebody, anybody, read those for me. So all of the above happened because we're human and most of our human behaviors are guided from emotions. So that's why we wanna manage by fact as much as possible. So I mentioned earlier that Church Help has an internal quality improvement course. Um, we host this course a couple of times a year for our staff because the goal is for me, other leaders, not to be the expert at this. It's for our entire team to know how to use data to make some decisions. We believe strongly in growing our team from within, right? I don't plan on working forever. I need somebody else to do it behind me. So the goal is to just always have this learning going. And so at our organization, we've created a culture of quality improvement and continuous learning. All right, so quality um, class lessons, right? Big things, right? Managed by fact, over feelings, understanding the why, so a little bit to the point of why is that 3.4% of patients checking in late, right? And it's totally various reasons for that happening. And then focusing on continuous improvement because all of us are in healthcare. We know. Story of our lives is change, change, change. If you are not okay with adapting in the healthcare world, you are probably in the wrong setting. Right, things constantly change. They change from an office perspective, the policies and procedures. Some changes are driven by the government side of things. Some are driven by insurances. Some, if you're a FQHC, right, they're driven by money decisions, right? It's change is always gonna happen, which is why you always wanna focus on continuous improvement. For our QI projects, this is the outline that we follow. Once you've determined your project need, you bill it off of your QI tools. And this is all around your data. Voice of the customer, rest with collecting feedback from all customers that influence the process. Collecting data from the customers that influence the process. All right, y'all, so once we get a little bit further, I'm going to show y'all my real true QI project. We're gonna roll through it based on these points. Cool beans? All right. Um, Step two, establishing a baseline, using existing data and information to define the magnitude of the unfavorable results, process mapping, fishbone diagram, I don't have one, establishing a success measure, and then the PDSA cycle. So project need for mine was around revenue cycle, um, and the issue was we received, we're receiving a lot of PCP denials. So state of Tennessee, Medicaid, not sure about other states. If you don't, during the pandemic, they, they rested on it. Now they're back to it. Implemented several years ago that if you're not the PCP of record for a Medicaid member, you're not gonna get paid for the claim, okay? Those denials are a big deal because it means that we have given away free services. Stand on top of this building and then just throw the money off. All right, nobody wants to throw money away. Um, especially those of us that are working in underserved settings that are depending on that very little dollar that they're gonna give to us, all right? So what we noticed was that it seemed like it was always happening. How many people think we blame the process? We didn't, we blame the people. We blame the people. Um, our patient services team is responsible for collecting and submitting those PCP change forms on the date of service for us to truly be validated as the primary care provider of record for that day. And we really thought our PSAs were not doing it right. Spoiler, part of it was them. <laughs> <laughs> Gave us an opportunity to teach something, um, but it, it wasn't 100% of them. So, did our investigation, right? 
We were averaging about 23 to 27 miles per month, caused us to lose revenue, right? We wanted to understand why it was happening. And so we talked about voice of the customer. So our customer in this process was the PSAs at the desk, the eligibility lead, as well as the revenue services team. Now, the financials. This number, that's half of somebody's salary that we wrote off in just a few months. But just know that this is unadjudicated. That's just our, our true bill amount. All right, voice of the customer. Step number one, smart goal. Decrease the denial rate 15% by December 25, I mean by December 15, 2023, right? <clears throat> Revenue department had a, grown accustomed to blaming the front desk staff. They aren't doing it right. They're not filling the form out right. They ain't faxing the form. They faxing it to the wrong number. The patient hadn't signed it. Like all of the things, the team blamed the PSAs. When we did voice of the customer, we learned from the PSAs some barriers they had. They weren't their fault. They just hadn't reported them to us. Next Gen was set up with a mirror group as the name, probably United Healthcare Community Plan fax number. Well, that's a problem. Some PSAs fax a lot to one payer versus the next payer, so the system automatically defaulted because it was real smart and was still sending it to the wrong place even though they selected the right one. Um, one that I didn't put up here that it just came to mind was that the system didn't tell us always on the same day that a fax failed. It would tell us overnight because in the background it was constantly trying to fax it and the team never knew that their fax was not successful. Again, something that didn't have anything to do with them. Step number two, establishing a baseline. After we determined our project need, we knew we needed to reduce the number of denials that were associated with the PSA's failure to accurately complete the form. And why did we say we needed, we were very specific about that, and it was for this reason. Because we realized that when we were analyzing our data, 12% of our denials were not related to a PSA issue. So even if we got the team 100% right, there was still gonna be denials that we did not want. So. Part of our project was I pulled off that 12% and started to work through those. You want to know why? Because they were from Blue Cross and United Healthcare Community Plan. No matter what my team did, how right or wrong they did it, we were still not getting paid. Anybody interested in knowing what United Healthcare and Blue Cross did? Yes. Had my doc set up wrong. Had them set up as not covering for one another on the contract as if we were truly multiple entities under the same tax ID number. Weird, right? But anyway, they can keep some money in their pocket, right? That's the goal. So what I did was got with my reps. Hey guys, these are wrong. Pay me. They didn't just pay me. They took me through the ringers and it was fine, right? But we did get to go back and make sure that our providers were set up right in their system as covering for one another so that Dr. A seeing Dr. B's patient wouldn't get denied because we're all in the same group. Because who's gonna change a PCP because one doc is on vacation? Nobody. Second thing we found was that United Healthcare actually had an issue in their system. Thankfully, their person was really nice and told me they had an issue in their system, a known issue that they were only telling people when they told them it was a problem. So bottom line on top on this one, that 12% we were able to recover. They were good and I'm, I'm appreciative for that. We were able to go back 12 months and any claims that were denied in error, we were able to recoup payment for those. Some we weren't even looking for, so I'm glad. Step three, process mapping. All right, so this probably does not make sense to you and it really doesn't matter to this particular presentation, but I'm gonna tell you anyway because this is what makes the story make sense. For our office, because we see about 20% insured patients, our team is used to seeing uninsured. So we follow a process the day before called chart prepping, where the team goes in, two-step process. One, they're verifying through Tennessee anytime if patients have a Medicaid plan they have not told us about. Because we want to get that Medicaid information 
and not have them be self-pay paying out of pocket. Second part of that is we're looking for the PCP of record because we know our patient community, right? Depending on the barriers they have, they make decisions for that day. So they may go to another provider's office because they couldn't get in with us, change the PCP, then bounce back to us and we need to change it again. So that's what they're looking for. So that's this whole process map. It's just telling us what that team does to get to the point of understanding if we need to do a PCP change form. And once we identify if we need to do a PCP change form, it requires that it's complete, correct, just 100% completed and correctly. Patient's name, information, parent signature, not initials, that is dated, provider ID numbers right, member ID numbers right, all the things, and sent on the date of service to the right fax number. So that's the process map that we looked at. Because at first, our assumption was this issue is happening with our PSAs. Now, fishbone is what's next. We did not do a fishbone. It's a cause and effect. So all the causes, what the effect is, is it mother nature, is it processes, is it measurements, is it whatever. We didn't do that, and we didn't do it in our QI project because we had numerous causes, and that poor fish would have been really big. So what we did was focused on what we knew, continue to analyze data, also work with the payers to get what we needed. All right, success measurement. So based on our baseline data, all right, we looked at the 67 denials we talked about earlier, we analyzed them. 34, the form wasn't submitted. I don't know why we filled the form out and didn't get the signature on it. Well, filled it out, got the signature and didn't send it. Don't know. Nine, the form was not completed correctly, so there were things that were missing. Patient's date of birth may not have been on it. Y'all know how this goes with insurance. Miss one step, they take you all your money. Just little things, maybe not been a signature. The parent didn't put a date on it, just whatever. Um, eight were faxed to the incorrect number. Unintentional of the PSA, it was a system issue that we identified earlier on. Seven were Blue Cross and nine United Healthcare errors. Success measurement. <clears throat> what we found through this, Marquina is one of our revenue team members. She analyzed that. We were able to take those errors from Blue Cross and United Healthcare, and we chose to make that our win. We got paid, y'all. So that was the win. All the other ones, right, those were on our team. There was nothing we could do about those. But what we have done in retrospect is pre-field forms, trained our team to do PCP change forms online as much as possible because it won't let you miss a step. And then we said we were not going to worry as much about next-gen faxing things for us use old fax machine so you know you get a confirmation page. Because this project is so new, um, I don't have like our end result, end result, but instead of our original goal of decreasing by 15% in denials, we were able to decrease by 10, 7% of them were because of the insurance, but our team has learned by way of us educating them and really showing them how important the work they do is to the end result. So it was helpful. So I asked you, what are you gonna be working on? Or how can I answer questions about things you may want to work on or need to work on as it relates to data and how you use data to be able to drive decisions? I'm done talking, seriously, y'all. So I really want us to just get into conversations. How can I help you around what data I have used to be able to pull any of these things as we work through our QI projects or what is it that you need of me? All right, hope this was helpful for you all. Um, I hope y'all have a great rest of the conference and safe travels home.